podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome to episode 110 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. Um, Yeah, and I do need to find a new way of introducing you. And what we're going to be talking about in this episode is how to use touch in the therapy process. Yeah, yeah just it's a great title, but I was just laughing because... Off air, you, 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 we talk about the use of touch on, in psychotherapy, and you said without being arrested. Yes. And, uh, Caveat. <laughs> How to not get arrested. <laughs> it's a bit like that, in a way, because with the sort of increasement of, lit- how can I explain this? People's fear of litigation. Yeah. Which I think um, leads to what I call defensive psychotherapy. Um, people are very, and certainly beginning psychotherapists um, are particularly sort of apprehensive about this whole subject of touching psychotherapy. I mean, I think it's a a very big area and specifically for, as I said, for beginning in psychotherapy and also even sort of um, experienced practitioners uh, sort of start to think, what should I do if somebody asks, one of my clients asks me for a hug or um, if I decide to touch them in some ways, um, where does that leave me? So even experienced psychotherapists, I think, may be apprehensive around touching psychotherapy. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yeah. There's, a lot, there's, a, there's a lot written about it. It's a controversial subject. But Which you know, is a shame because it is a form of connection. When we touch another human being, it is a form of connection and empathy and relationships and all that sort of stuff. That's right. Uh, I, and I, and um, I think we need to be clear about what we mean by therapy because there's different types of therapy. There's body therapy, for example. Yeah. There's um, all the spiritual therapies. There's cognitive therapy. Um, there's emotional therapy, if you want to put it that way. And I can think of many therapies uh, which see cure as expression of emotion. So I think we need to be clear what we mean by therapy. Um, and then a good way to look at this, I think, is look at the phrase psychological contact. Um, because I think there's many articles written about what is psychological contact. Uh, as well as what is physical contact. And in in the therapeutic domain, uh, it's important to think of, I I think of it this way, that it's not just uh, going to be, um, you know, at the nonverbal level, it's really important that you contract for any physical touch. Yeah. In therapy. That's the first, first sort of tip I can give anybody beginning or experienced psychotherapist that if you're going to make any physical contact which you might argue as a psychological function you need to get consent first yeah you need to ask and say you will need to ask about it so if you're going to if you're going to decide that your client needs a hug for example in terms of uh, um, you know whatever treatment you're doing then you need to ask them first is that okay you don't just go and hug them because you think they need a hug. Yeah. Because once you do that, several things happen. Your assumption might be totally incorrect. They might need not need a hug, for example. Yeah. You're also taking away the whole concept of self-agency once you start um, assuming and taking things into your own hand. There has to be a bilateral contact for contract, I believe, for touch. Now, listeners here might disagree with me, but I think it's very very important that that happens when you're saying that do you mean at the beginning of therapy like in the written contract no you mean in the session before yeah. you right yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah you might you might put it in the written contract that's not a problem is it of course i've not put it in my written contract but i i would always verbally contract with them yeah 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 whenever you're going to um 
physically touch somebody, then it's very important to ask their permission, if you want to put it that way, or their consent, because you leave yourself open to a whole minefield if you don't. Yeah. yeah. And I can't see any reason why any I can't see any reason why any therapist wouldn't ask for consent and talk about um, this process of psychotherapy. No, I wouldn't. I suppose it depends on the seating arrangements, whether it's kind of like the only way I can think it might happen without contract is if it was just a, a you know, an instinctive gesture. But I sit on a chair and my clients sit on a couch opposite me, so I would have to physically get up and move towards them. So it's not something I would do unconsciously or out of my awareness, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think it's very, very important that if a therapist um, doesn't know what to do, so, for example, say uh, they think there's a relational need for initiation to be met. Uh, I was thinking of clients who might be um, in their history had emotional or physical neglect. Yeah. So um, the therapist might be thinking, oh, well, this person needs a hug, or if there's emotional expression and they're crying or whatever it is. Um, I suggest anyway, as a matter of course, that the therapist does not take that assumption off, you know, on their own bat. They ask the client first. Yeah. You know, uh, it's very easy to do it. Not only do they verbally do that, but they need to have a clinical thought process behind the initiation of contact and not just do it out of some sort of spontaneous whim yeah. or some instinct. Um, that has to be clinical thought. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I know for me, it can be quite, not so much now, but uh, in the early days, it can be quite uncomfortable to witness outward emotion in a therapy room without feeling like you need to do something to kind of stop it or prevent it or make them feel better but that isn't necessarily part of the therapeutic process no certainly isn't because the person or the client might need to express their emotion and in fact the um, hug if the therapist desire you know even ask the client for a hug um, may be counterproductive yeah. to the treatment and may close down emotion yeah. in terms of soothing them when actually they need to get the emotions out. Yeah. So sometimes it is just sitting there and, you know, sitting in the space. And One of the things that I do do is ask them if they need anything from me right now rather than actually saying, do you need a hug? I'll say, is there anything that you need from me right now? Obviously, I don't just let them, you know, cry hysterically in the room and not do anything. But I don't tend to presume that they need anything. I think it's very important to have a contract. A yeah. session contract, a moment-to-moment -moment contract. Yeah. If you think you are going to hug them without asking them, you have to ask yourself very strongly the clinical reason for that. Yeah. It, it, things do come up. For me in therapy, not necessarily in the moment when it's needed, but I will say to the client, you know, things like, how will I know if you get angry at me in a session? So I'm a, you're kind of aware of certain emotions that might come out. And, you know, if you do get upset in a session, is there anything that you'd like me to do at that point? Mm -hmm. So I've kind of, we've spoke about it. Yeah. That's great. Um as a transaction analyst, I'd like to encourage the people who listen to this podcast or watching on YouTube to think about what ego state the person is in or coming from when you think they need a hug. Or yeah. even when you think of asking the person, is, is it okay to have a hug? Um, that's really important because if you think about it this way, if you're working with um, regression developmentally, then... You know, if you think about this in terms of child ego state, the person could be seven, could be 10, could be three. 
most likely they'll go to the level of trauma. Um, but you are going to be then um, in the land of a, a younger person. Yeah. And, you know, um, physical contact might be very necessary in, the, in, in where you started right at the beginning in terms of uh, external communication, the deliver of empathy, uh, yeah. the reassurance, the soothing, um, the nurturing other. I can think of many reasons why touch might be necessary in the healing process. And you need to ask them first. And also remember to think about it clinically because they could also simply adapt to you. Yeah. Yeah, it, particularly like you say, whatever ego state they're coming from, if they're coming from the adaptive child ego state, or yeah. Uh, and, and so, if, if they are, if you are thinking they're adapting, you need to ask it again, see if you can get it from the adult ego state, the transaction back again, rather than taking an adapted transaction. Yeah. Because we talked about um, in one of the podcasts years and years ago about the please me driver. So if the young child, in, in terms of the developmental aggressive position I'm talking about, thinks they have to please you for strokes, they yeah. may adapt and you're not getting an adult contract at all. No. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, following on from that, there's kind of like the, the I'm OK, you're OK in the adult transaction, which is what you're saying rather than, you know, I'm OK, you're not OK. As much as you can, you need the contract for touch from the adult ego state. Now, I understand in regressive developmental work, the person might have uh, gone to a younger place based spontaneously. So it, it may not be so easy to get an adult contract. But as much as you can, I think it's important that you do. Yeah. And it's, if I always, and I know it's, it might sound a bit, you know, heavy or not, either, but I kind of always debrief afterwards. If ever I have, you know, we, we have touched, a, a client's asked me for a hug specifically in, in a session when they were getting, I think they were feeling overly anxious and that she said, you know, can I have a hug, please? Um, so I, I did, I went and sat by her and I gave her a hug, but we had a debrief after about how they felt rather than not talking about it after the fact. I think that can be quite therapeutic. You know, why did you feel the need to ask me for a hug and, you know, just, yeah, talk about it? Because potentially they could get a backlash when they're outside the therapy room. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's a very good professional stance that you take there. Definitely. and. I'll repeat again as well that though I see the many, many, many benefits of um, psychological contact through um, touch, for example, in all the ways you said, there is another way of looking at this, and I'm repeating what I said five minutes ago, but I think it's important, that touch may also close someone down. Mm. Now that probably might be strange for the podcast listeners to hear, um, but I think it's true. Yeah, because the um, client may psycho. It's in psychoanalytical terms, so it's an unconscious process, and may manipulate you to give them a hug or or soothe them, so they don't go to where they need to go to. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Absolutely. But it's how you would know that that's what they were doing. That's what, maybe what the confused look is for. <laughs> I think it's going back about 20 transactions, Jackie, we were just talking about. Um, TA therapists are trained to look for adaptations. Mm. And, and, you know, this try hard, you know, the drivers are all talking about. Yeah. And also, maybe many of the podcast podcast listeners coming from different modalities are trained also to look for the defense systems around adaptation as well so i don't want to scout that however um clinically you need to think about is this person adapting to me here 
Yeah. It's a very important question. So one of the reasons you'll know is if you feel that they're not being genuine, uh, if you think they're over adapting to you, if you think that um, they're, they're, they're trying to manipulate in some ways to get um, some touch or hugs to to not develop their own sense of expression of emotion or go to where they need to go to. Um, I know it's a clinical judgment, but you should be thinking clinically all the time anyway. Yeah. You could even ask the person if you felt in some ways there was a lack of authenticity or a defense system or adaptation. You could ask them, oh, yeah, you know, I'd really like to give you a hug. And I was wondering which ego state this request has come from. Or I was wondering what would happen if I didn't. Now, people again listening to this may want to have have different thoughts on this process but they are clinical options you can take without yeah. rushing in willy-nilly yeah absolutely and i do agree i think it, it can be a way of avoiding certain things oh, oh well without doubting without doubt yeah <coughs> and i think you know hopefully the listeners listeners might even notice that in you know not necessarily in a therapeutic relationship but in our own personal relationships that sometimes we can use you know touch and hugs and affections as a way of diverting from something absolutely um i'll tell you what it could be it could be the encouragement of self-agency the uh the, the process where they move away from taking action uh, there's many reasons they may encourage um that process to of touch, which actually shuts them down. This will all be done unconsciously, shuts them down. Yeah. Taking action, for example. Yeah. Having said Absolutely. all that, I don't want people to listen to this to think that I'm not in favor uh, in terms of relational work to look for relational needs. And for people who've had particular trauma or people who have had um, quite a lot of neglect in the history I think touch can be extraordinarily important but it needs to be done with a contract yeah touch can be really powerful if it's used appropriately and at the right time <laughs> in in you know in the therapy process definitely yeah and most of the body therapists or the therapists that come from the belief systems of embodied trauma well i would imagine and hopefully have an adult contract um for touch because um often the trauma is held in the body yeah i was thinking massage therapists here particularly and i was i had a massage the other day and I, 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 you know i didn't know the person particularly but we were talking afterwards about uh, the person's training and i said well i think all massage people who train in massage actually should have some training in counseling skills or understanding the, the whole process of trauma being held in the body mm. because you know clients can go to particularly uh, or be tr triggered back to particularly sensitive times and the masseuse person a might even be unaware of that and not know what to do yeah absolutely yeah, there's, there's a book in there. Is it the body holds the score? Is it Eckhart? Yeah, was, yeah. yeah, that yeah, yeah. Talks all about embodiment, embodied therapy, and uh, and um, a lot of the traumas held in. It's called the body knows the score. I think the traumas held in the body. So that's a plea for massage therapists to think about things in this way, and of course. You know, as I said earlier on, you know, body therapists, massage therapists, they all will use touch. And touch is really, really uh, one of the w quickest ways to get through people's defense systems. Yeah. Now, there has to be a contract for that, though. Other, way, other ways you could, I know it's a strong word, I'm using it attentively, 
And if you don't get a contract, I think you could be in the um, in the world of abusing them. I was going to say there's a the very fine line, isn't there? There's a grey area there about you know, yeah, whether you cross the line or not. That's very important. You know, another really big area to think about, and uh, I think therapists are trained in this and are thinking more about this every day. Um, and it's a very common word now used a lot in training, and that's the area of neurodiversity. Yeah. Because with the neurodiverse client, particularly I was thinking of people high on the Asperger's uh, process or high on autism, or they, 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 they certainly would feel very overwhelmed, I think, if the therapist decides to suddenly touch them. Yeah, absolutely. They wouldn't have an understanding necessarily. Yeah. They feel overwhelmed and want to shrink back. Yeah. So we have to think about neurodiversity when we're thinking about touch, I think. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, if they are on the spectrum, the spectrum is quite a wide ranging one. So we might not always have an awareness of that, you know, especially in the early days of seeing a client. Yeah, and uh, I was, um, in fact, I don't see clients now, but I was talking to a therapist about this and they've gone on some training and they talked about the use of touch with neurodiverse people. And there was somebody in the room who was very um, high on the Asperger's scale and felt, what's the word? I, I, I want a slight better word than abused, but certainly invaded. Yeah. Therapist um, hugged them without consent. Yeah. And I can see, I can see that, you know, yeah, definitely. I thought I think it's really important debriefs as well. What you said earlier on, I think that's a very good uh, practice as a psychotherapist. If you're going to do any of this developmental work, even though you might have a contract, um, and even though it might be important for for touch um, around the healing of trauma, I think it's important that's talked about. Yeah, what will happen is that the client will probably move development developmentally to a different ego state an adult ego state and in the debrief um you can talk about this and talk about treatment process in it and the reason about every or what we're talking about here now yeah yeah absolutely because it, it's about them being in an okay place when they leave the therapy room that there isn't any shame or guilt or embarrassment or any anything like that which to be fair, even if there isn't any touch involved, if a client does get emotional, I usually do that before they leave anywhere. And, and there's a rise of what I would call cognitive therapy at the moment in 2023. You've got the NHS, which um, CBT is the favoured modality, uh, where cognition and behaviour has been the major method for cure. Yeah. So, so there, there is a rise of cognitive therapies and behavioural therapies who, from that position, they would see cognition and behavioural um, processes as the way for cure and no need for touch at all. Now, we could call, by the way, look at cognitive distortions and some of the behavioural tasks I'm talking about, a psychological contact through transactions, for example. Um, but they wouldn't be taught about, I'm going to see the need, I think, for touch. Yeah. Now, the Gestalt therapist or the EFT therapist or the developmental regressive therapist or some of the integrative ther therapists, um, they would think about the healing being in the past, not the present. So it would work regressively or developmentally where the trauma is and would certainly certainly argue for the need for um, touch uh, as being the he a healing process uh, with the traumatised child. Yeah. It's interesting because I, I the equine therapy that, that we do, it's really emotive when people are touching the horse or when the horse makes a move towards them and the horse, you know, touches them. 
it physically brings up emotion for people. So touch is really powerful. It, it is immensely powerful. And usually with a neglected child or a traumatized child, um, trauma, sorry, uh, touch is an important process. Yeah. Um, utilize. So I think we, we know that. And equine therapy I don't know much about, but I really understand that. I have two two dogs, and one of the dogs is would be a wonderful for a therapy dog. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I think there's so much in touch here. Another thing I just want to say before we sort of finish on the podcast here, and that is that we're talking about adult psychotherapy here. You do not touch. Let's put it another way. Um, therapists who work in children below the age of 18 do not touch. No. Regardless. Yeah. They're, they're sort of loco parents, if you like. Um, and uh, it's a very important process, tip for anybody listening. However you think the child might need a hug or or pat on the back or whatever it is, um, contract or no contract, you don't do it. Mm, absolutely. 100% agree. Yeah. Because yeah, it, it's a very difficult situation. <laughs> Having been a foster carer, we were always told that, do you know what I mean, we would never be in a room with a looked after child with the, with the door closed. No. do you know what I mean obviously I'm not talking about bedrooms and things like that they could close the bedroom doors but do you know what I mean we would never shut the living room door if I was on my own in the room with one of the looked after children but confidentiality wise you need to close the door in a therapy room so you do need to protect yourself from any anything in that room really yeah yeah any interpretation exactly yeah finding the truth I mean, you worked with children in a whole, this whole area, so you must be very clear here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it sounds awful, but it is about protecting yourself in that situation because, you know, they might not say something in malice, but, you know, accusations and allegations, you know, can be made. Absolutely. Oh, I've heard about it many times, unfortunately. Yeah. So that's sort of one thing I wanted to say because we've been talking about adult psychotherapy uh, and there's many, many therapists who work with children and adolescents um, where it touches, uh, we just don't do it. Yeah. Yeah, you, you need to protect yourself. You need to protect yourself as far as the adults are concerned, but even more so where children are concerned. Yeah. I sort of wanted to say that for people listening who might be working with children and adolescents. Yeah. It's a very controversial area, this, in terms of adult psychotherapy, I think. There's a lot written about uh, use of touch or not touch. But for the very beginning psychotherapists, I think the most important thing is if you think, oh, should I touch the client, should I not touch the client, I would like you to step back a moment in your head and think about two things. One, the clinical reason why you, you think that person might need a hug. And secondly, and perhaps the most important, that if you decide to go ahead with it, you ask them first. Yeah. And the third, and this is vitally important, and we say it many, many times in this podcast, you need to take that clinical intervention and what happens next to, to supervision mm. and to discuss the reasons why you decided to ask the client is it okay if I hug you or, or whatever you did? Yeah. And you need to discuss the response back again. And what was the th clinical thinking about initiating touch in the process? Yeah. So contracts, clinical thought, and the use of supervision is vital when you when you want to bring touch into uh, the therapy process. Yeah. Now, I'm somebody who spent years working developmentally and aggressively and 
have used touch many, many times from clinical reasons that I could talk about here. Uh, I've taken this to supervision many times, but I have always, I think, well, I don't know, I've been going a long time, um, got consent first with the client. Yeah. The other thing, we should have had a second podcast this on this jacket, but the other thing we could talk about here, we've got a couple of minutes to talk about it, and that is, um, how can I say, when you ask the client, here's a kind of scenario for you. So the client's getting distressed, and so you think, oh, well, the client perhaps needs a hug here. So you ask them, and they say yes, then they give you a hug, and you think everything's okay, and they come back and then they talk about it not being okay because you you were just like or you felt like um you know my abuser for my history mm. and what you've forgotten in the whole process or well, hopefully i've made this up so it wouldn't happen um is that the person's got a history of sexual abuse so some clients many many well you know i talked about traumas but we're talking about sexual abuse here particularly the hug may not be a hug. Yeah. It might be a hug from you. But for the person on the other side of it, it can easily turn into uh, transferentially the hug from the abuser. Yeah. Is that, is yeah. that in the transfers world? Yeah, yeah. You do, you do need to be very, very careful about... Like you say, you know, even if you verbally you contract and they say yes, it's what happens after that, yeah, that it might bring up something for them. That's yeah, especially if people have been uh, used uh, inappropriately, they've been sexually abused, they have a history of sexualized uh, inappropriateness. Um, in the transference, you can they can make you easily. That may not start out this way into the abuser from their history in terms of projection yeah yeah so it's, it's not something to do lightly in a session no mm. uh, uh, and especially again if you work in the world of transfers then you may think x yeah but in the transferential process and you may never know this you don't you become someone else and that's someone else might have been the abuser from their own history. Yeah. Now, now then transference gets all mixed up. And you and and in that process, you know, it's like, well, the client repeats history and therapy goes nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like, a, you know, like you say, it'll be a trust that's broken transferentially. That, that's what it'll feel like, that something's, yeah, something's changed in the relationship, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I like I said, it's not something that I, I think there's only two occasions, and on both occasions, I've been asked by the client to give them a hug. Yeah, I do tend to use my body language and lean forward and, do you know what I mean, drop the tone of my voice and nurture them in that way. But it's not something that I would feel comfortable doing. No, you're, what you're talking about there is you're transacting psychological contact uh, by, you know, the, in that way. So, but once we get into this process of transferential worlds. Yeah. Um, Working regressively, psychodynamically, developmentally, often, you know, you aren't who you think the client thinks you are. In other words, they often project to you the negative object into you, or yeah. can, uh, and you may not even know about it, and you end up repeating history. Yeah, which happens in therapy anyway. But if you put touch into the mix with a somebody that's been abused, it's it's yeah it's a, a big deal very big so the three tips one is you make sure you have consent for your client so secondly you are aware of transference like i've just said 
Um, thirdly, that you take this to supervision. Yeah. Fourthly, if you think about, step back and think about this clinically, what is the reason I'm doing this for or offering this for? Yeah. And maybe having my ex foster carer head on, making sure that you make a note of it <laughs> in, yes. in your notes, potentially, if you do keep notes that, you know, on this occasion, what happened, just so that you've got a, a term of reference for it. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I've known where I've known things go dreadfully wrong, mm. not just for the client in terms of there's been a repeating of history and you know therapy's gone not the direction uh, not a healthy direction but also for the therapist where they've been accused of something being sexually inappropriate or whatever we want to say here and they know that wasn't their intention at all yeah absolutely and yeah and projective identification the therapist can find themselves suddenly in a transferential nightmare. Yeah. So not wanting to scare the living daylights out of any therapist <laughs> out there. Not. But, you know, my <laughs> advice would always be cover your back. That's what I always used to say as well, a foster carer. <laughs> to think about it clinically, use supervision and ask the client their three yeah. golden rules. But also, yeah, well, those are the three golden rules. I, 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 I use them all the time. And, um, I'd really like what you said, uh, which is debrief from an adult position. Uh, yeah. if, you don't, if you do go down that road at all. Yeah, absolutely. So next time, Bob, I think it will kind of follow on quite well from this. We're going to be talking about therapy by rote, the inexperienced therapist. Oh, yes. that's. Uh, I, I, I can't quite go back 40 years, but... I certainly took a long time, I think, to move away uh, from, you know, take things by rote in the therapy process. So, yeah. Okie dokie. Until next time, Bob. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.